in a more um, uh, diverse way. Uh, so here it goes. Um, now, before anything else, I would like to uh, uh, thank you to, 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 to acknowledge the contribution of many people from my group and uh, many of our collaborators, including Professor Hall, who has joined us uh, for, for the um, uh, different aspects of the research that I'm going to present. Uh, this is by no means an uh, uh, kind of like completely uh, inclusive list. Uh, most important, of course, is the, uh, the contribution of the group. I'm going to come back to that again uh, at the end of the talk. Um, but um, uh, this has been a research performed over quite a few years. Part of it was a result of um, our, uh, the activity of our uh, prestigious material research science and engineering center, uh, where Dr. Ho and I were uh, very involved at the time, and uh, Dr. Tracy as well. Um, so, even though I'm going to show an, a number of uh, a number of slides from a number of uh, research topics, um, I really would like to the first uh, to define first what are the questions that we want to discuss in in, in in this in this talk, right? Why I'm showing this these slides? Um, so the the type of questions that I'm going to be answering involve how does one one make magnetic structures uh, that are so that have special properties. I'm going to start with how one can make magnetically uh, actuated structures at all, but then uh, how does when uh, one make uh, particle structures that are ultra soft, that may be highly flexible, that may have hinges um, uh, as kind of like as part of their function. Um, there is always fundamental involved in the research that we are working on, especially these topics. Um, I'm not going to discuss many of the uh, intricate fundamental details, uh, but uh, something that always emerges in this type of, uh, of research and presentation is what are the interactions, the assembly rules, uh, the resulting, in this case, particle um, uh, from the particle assembly, what are the resulting structure property relationships in the type of structures that we'll be discussing. Um, and then you want to use those for um, another fundamental purpose once you make them. Um, of course, having responsive, uh, uh, adaptive uh, or active in this case structures is very important uh, but we also want to discuss uh, how can one uh, measure calibrate the forces and stresses uh, as means of having those particles uh, particle structures also being used as two in uh, quite uh, in, in studying other type of structures so now uh, everybody knows what happens when you when you have an external field and when you apply it to uh, a, a material, especially magnetic field, uh, you can say, well, magnetic field attracts stuff, right? Um, both magnetic and ele electrostatic interactions or electric, electric field driven interactions, which we study quite a bit in our group, um, actually can be uh, broadly divided in two big uh, groups of um, uh, interaction types. And uh, our research in this topic has started, uh, well, practically since uh, I have been a faculty at, uh, at NC State. Uh, part of our original research has involved the assembly uh, and formation of, uh, of simple structures from particles in electrical fields. Um, I'm going to discuss the difference between electric and magnetic fields soon, but the two uh, big group, group of effects that are involved in this uh, in, in similar type of uh, research are illustrated here. Um, so uh, you can apply uh, a field in this case, electrical field. And you can see in this case, with magnet, uh, in the first, uh, what you see here on the left-hand side is uh, you have gold nanoparticles. Uh, and what you have on the right-hand side is latex particles. So, um, I mean, you can see them here, you cannot, you cannot see them here. What you are seeing on the left-hand side is the motion and assembly of gold nanoparticles by electrical field, which is being driven by the gradient of the field towards the end of the, of the structure that is being formed here. Essentially, the field brings in the particles towards the area of highest field gradient, towards the place where the, the gradient is strongest, and, and this is where they stick. And once they stick, they irreversibly aggregate, so this results in the formation of this microwire structure that we uh, have uh, reported as, uh, um, uh, together with my first uh, PhD students at NC State. Uh, what you see on the right hand side is the formation of chain structures in the external field. Uh, both, of those prop, uh, both of those assembly modes occur because you have um, a polarization of the particles inside the fields. 
Uh, so when you, uh, when you have polarization, you have a dipole, which responds to the field. This dipole can interact, again, I mentioned the gradient. This is where the field is stronger. Uh, it can interact with the gradient and it can make the particles stick here to the end of the growing structure. Uh, you can also have the dipoles organize themselves in, in a chain. Uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, if you imagine how dipoles would interact, you can think of plus minus here or north south, and then you're going to have the formation of chains. So, uh, terminologically, uh, the type of assembly that you are seeing here uh, would be either the electrophoretic, in this case, uh, uh, driven by the gradient. In the case of magnetic field, this is going to be called magnetophoretic assembly. And, uh, and what you have here is chaining. Um, uh, notice that you, you are going to have additional interaction between those dipoles. Uh, so the combination of those two effects gives us a very rich uh, opportunity to assemble different types of new materials and structures, as I'm going to illustrate, and we're going to make it complex soon. So uh, how do you, uh, if you're a researcher, what do you do when you start investigating something like that? Um, well, you start building on complexity, <laughs> meaning that first you start with simple particles and simple fields, and then you either use complex fields or use complex particles. Uh, this is what we have done and our group has been a, a pioneering edge of uh, similar research for quite a few years. So what I'm going to discuss next is how you can make more complex fields and how you can, uh, um, uh, and how you can uh, make more complex particles and what are the type of structures resulting from this case. Um, so, uh, just before I, uh, I move on here, it's kind of good to already start a little bit of uh, interaction and have some of you join in. Uh, so now what I'm showing here is electrical fields. These are particles that are kind of like in this case gold or latex. Um, what would be the difference between the electric and magnetic fields that relate to particle assembly in this case, right? So if you want to summarize on your own how how those uh, structures would be different. How would you explain the difference between uh, electric and magnetic fields? I mentioned that you're going to have magnetophoresis and magnetic chaining, uh, but what is the fundamental difference in, in those two interactions? Let's see who would like to kind of, I can jump in, kind of suggest a few things so we can get going with some discussion also. I haven't noticed kind of like my group members to be too shy. <laughs> so any of you who kind of would like to kind of really suggest a few ideas. So imagine that you have, you want to manipulate particles in similar uh, ways by using uh, magnetic fields. Um, what would be the difference between the electric and magnetic fields which relate to particle manipulation and assembly? I, for those of you, and kind of like if you would like, I mean, you're welcome to come on your, to turn on your camera so you can see each other. Uh, but now I can see my kind of like, I mean, being thoughtful about this. So if you kind of like want yeah. to suggest a few. Uh -huh. um, so my first thought is that electrical fields, some can be either um, induced AC by AC or DC. Um, but I don't know if that's exactly what you're looking for here. Um, and I think of... Uh, well, that's a very good one. This is a good start, right? I mean, so magnetic fields do not have a frequency dependence, which right. is important in the case of electrical fields. Uh, I mean, you can think of this, of them as being all, all, always uh, DC in a sense. Well, that's, uh, that, that, that was my train of thought. That's kind of where I tailed off. Uh, well, how about, I mean, you can say, how about the universality of those interactions, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, Anything is going to be polarized in electrical field. And uh, obviously you need magnetic component in order to have something polarized and responding in magnetic field, right? Um, now there is also one kind of like important component which I'm not going to be discussing too much here because we're discussing magnetic fields, but um, something that is specific and you can see here in those formulas you have uh, the so-called trio or imaginary component of the field. Uh, when it comes to electrical field, this can be positive or negative, which means that in, in some cases, actually the interactions can be repulsive or attractive in AC fields. Can you actually make repulsive interactions? That is, can you apply magnetic field? So this is a kind of like a trick question, if you will. 
can you apply magnet? So, so with electric fields, you can bring the particles together, or you can separate them depending on the frequency. Can you have the case where you're going to have a particle being repelled from the gradient of the field in magnetic field? The reason that you can have repulsion in electrical field is if you have water and the water responds to the field with higher polarizability than the particle, then the particle is going to get out. How can you make a magnetic particle that is going to uh, have, let's say, lower magnetic polarizability than the medium? Can you do that or not? So I, I want to say no, because like when you apply an electric or a magnetic field, wouldn't the particles just align in the direction of the magnetic field, like end to end? Well, they would. I mean, so essentially, uh, the two, and this is, this is a very good discussion because essentially when you have particles which align, uh, this is the chaining force. But what I'm meaning here in, in, in this case, I mean, it is going to apply to this case as well, but it's really clearer in this case. So, you know, that if you have a particle, I actually, I can try, let me see whether there is any magnetic component here. Okay, well, so here is two magnetic particles, if you will. So in, in the magnetic fields, you always seem to have attraction. Th this one is a magnetophoretic attraction in a sense, because this pen would like to go to the, to the field of highest field intensity. Um, and with, magne with magnetic particles, kind of like intuitively, you would always think that they would like to stick to the magnet, right? Can you have some very special case of particles that do not like to stick to a magnet, but be repelled out of the magnet? Uh, there is one special case which is, has been studied by some investigators. If, if you want to do that, you can replace the medium with um, a magnetically responsive fluid. Uh, this is typically, this can be a magnetological or other type of uh, fluid containing nanoparticles. And if you have a magnetic fluid, but non-magnetic particle, then it's going to be repelled. But uh, this is a kind of unique case, and obviously most of the fluids that we use are water. So in most of the cases, you know, when you have magnetic particles, similar interactions are going to be um, attractive. So I'm going to then discuss what, what we can do again with simple particles. Um, one uh, research that we performed kind of like years after that is the following. So now we can say, okay, so I want to assemble structures not only in one dimension, but in two dimensions. How can you do that? I can use a combination of two fields, magnetic and electric fields. Uh, I can apply electric fields in one direction, magnetic fields in another direction. I can control the mutual strengths of those fields and I am essentially controlling the interactions between those particles into the into the uh, into directions. So see what happens here. This is an example of what happens with uh, magnetic latex particles in this combination of the fields. You can kind of see the formation of uh, a structure in two dimensions. So you can see the formation of this structure, which in this case is going to be called uh, uh, two-dimensionally interconnected or two-dimensionally percolated. So it is percolated in two directions because you have two types of fields. Depending on how you control the strength of the fields, you can have different types of structures forming. Um, I'm showing this is an example of how one can use a combination between theory and experiment in similar type of system. Because, um, uh, and this was some years ago when I had the MERSEC, we had the collaboration with Dr. Hall, collaboration with some German colleagues who are also doing simulations. So this is the case of how one can uh, do uh, simulations of the particle system and the real system. The trick in doing a simulation in this case is what I, this is not a question for, the, for those of you who do simulations, but for the rest of you. So what is the trick in doing a simulation in a system like that? So the trick in doing experiments is of course, <laughs> getting the experimental details right, but what is the trick in doing a simulation of such system? Austin is looking thoughtfully. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of shown in, in one of the images here. Is it because you have to pretend everything is 2D? 
Well, it's everything is 2D, right? I mean, if it was 3D, I mean, like it would be, I assume, very, very computationally difficult, right? But when you construct a model of something like that, really the trick in, 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 in making the, world, the model work is constructing something with, within the model which replicates the reality. And the thing that you have to construct in this case, it's kind of shown here, is uh, being able to construct a potential that replicates the interaction in the real system in two dimensions in this case. So once you do something like that, so this is an example of a correlation between a simulation and an experiment in the assembly of such a system. I think some of you are going to find out kind of like the visual correlation uh, quite uh, appealing. Um, if, you, if you want to do a really uh, fundamental investigation of such system, you have to construct a certain parameter, use a certain parameter, which really allows to describe the properties and the structure of the system. So in this case, what has been done is we have compared uh, the energy levels of uh, different particles. Uh, and so what we have, what is plotted here, uh, is the energy distribution of the particles as a function uh, of, uh, of uh, I mean, essentially distribution of the particles along the simulation, along the experiment, you can see the good correlation between uh, theory and experiment. So uh, in the future, when we do assembly of similar systems, we're also interested in, in, in collaborating on uh, understanding how this structure would be replicated on a larger scale uh, with more complex particles, which I'm going to show next. Um, just to summarize this part of kind of the background, again, this is a tutorial, so kind of like the background, you can call the interactions that uh, we have here as multipolar. This meaning that you're going to have more than one dipole induced inside a particle, or you can assume this kind of like a model that, uh, that has more than one dipole. You are going to have multi-directional interactions. So by combining two fields, you can assemble any of the type of structure shown here. This is when we have complex fields. And then we can achieve a similar result uh, by using, instead of complex fields, using complex uh, particles, um, which are going to have a structural difference within a part on a particle level. And this structural difference is going to uh, make them interact and assemble into more complex structures. Um, the prototypical type of particles of similar type, I'm sure this is kind of like a word that is familiar to many of you, um, would be a genus particle. And I'm going to discuss um, uh, genus part particles next, but then uh, let me check for any questions or comments up to here. Because we're leaving the, uh, we're leaving the theoretical background and we're starting with making particles and, and making them complex. Any comments, questions here? There's a question in the chat. Uh, okay. Aha, uh -huh. uh, I see a group has a question. Uh, well, thank you. Um, is the interaction dependent on the concentration of the particles? Um, the interaction itself, once you establish it, is of course interaction which kind of hopefully was not, is not going to be too affected when the particles come together. However, the final outcome of this process is very much dependent on the concentration of the particles. This is why one needs to essentially combine experiment and theory, because you have too many parameters, you have very complex interactions, you can balance them by balancing the fields. And then depending on the concentration of the particles, you can have different types of structures forming, two-dimensional lattices, chains, lattices, um, nuclei, if you want, so on. So uh, concentration brings another component that needs to be investigated. It is very hard to investigate this experimentally if you think about it, because you have to make all kind of particle concentrations and try them out. Uh, so that's so that's one case where uh, again uh, simulation is really very useful. So the interaction does not depend on the concentration, but the final outcome is very much a function of the concentration. Good question. Anybody else? Well, okay. Uh, so uh, I mentioned genus particles. How do you make genus particles? Metal deposition. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, indeed. And, uh, and luckily we kind of thanks to need these uh, big efforts. 
and and Mike's also as well, of course. That is Amik um, uh, 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 Mike uh, Mike Mantini. Uh, we are back into business of making genus particles. So genus particles are hot uh, field. is is a hot research field these days. Uh, our group has been among the pioneers to establish this field many years ago, right? When we started making genus particles, people were really asking us what is what, what is this and what is it about. Um, but right now, this is a very routine type of uh, structure that many people were investigating. Um, the way we were uh, the way we were making genus particles at that stage, uh, that is years ago, um, is also a method that was developed by um, our um, uh, friend uh, uh, Iwana Kretschmer. Um, uh, from uh, City University of New York, uh, and we also have been using it in my group. Uh, Iwana Kretschmer has been kind of like affiliated with a few of our group members, and um, uh, Lillian uh, uh, here certainly knows her well, um, and, and actually has contributed to, I think, Iwana's research earlier on, on genus particles. Um, uh, what um, uh, what uh, we, we, we and the one did was essentially deposit a monolayer of the particles by using the convective assembly method that we had developed in my group as well. Uh, we discussed this method in our previous tutorial about coatings. So you can deposit a monolayer of particles, which is important because you want to coat only one, one part of it. You can do the evaporation in two ways. You can deposit straight down, in which case you're going to coat only half of them with metal, and then when you break them off, you have a half metallic genus particle. Or if you tilt, which this was kind of like you want mention, if you tilt the, 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 the whole monolayer, then you're going to deposit metal only on part of the particle, so you're going to have a patchy particle. Um, so now you can have a half coated or a patchy particle, uh, metal dielectric, you can have lots of fun with it once you start applying different types of fields. Uh, again, uh, the, the papers that are listed here by now are recognized as uh, uh, being uh, uh, the first papers to establish two effects relating to genus particles. One is the electrohydrodynamic mobility of genus particles in electric fields. Um, it's a very interesting phenomenon, and this phenomenon has been um, a morphing in more complex system over the years and is presently being investigated in our joint project uh, uh, between uh, our group and uh, our Israeli collaborators from Technion University, which is NIDIS project. Um, I'm not going to be discussing electrically driven particles here. If you have electric field, electric field polarization of particles, you're also going to have different dipoles. So this is the case where instead of having complex fields, you have a complex particles. You're going to have very strong polarization of the metallic uh, uh, half of the, part of the genus particle here. So now you're going to have interactions which are driven by the metallic half of the genus particles. So the genus particles uh, are sticking to each other not in the chains that I'm showing earlier, but in this type of staggered chains, where the metal being more polarizable is really driving, driving the assembly and driving the type of structure that is being formed. So you can think of this as another type of material. Uh, from materials perspective, you can think of this as an electrically conductive wire that is being self-assembled because the genus particles orient themselves in the right ways. Um, once you have something like that, then you can say, okay, uh, it works with electrical field, what else we can work with. Um, this is a funny story when you really kind of like do something that people appreciate later with kind of like without even really being uh, too purposeful about that. At that time we received an um, um, invitation to submit to a special uh, journal issue where leading investigators on genus particles would submit research. Uh, so we came together with Sumit Gangwao and Stoyan Smukov who were working at the, at the say, well, why don't we make those particles magnetic and, and report what happens with magnetic particles. And we quickly wrote a paper by that invitation, which became very well-cited paper, kind of acknowledging our contribution to the interaction of magnetic genus particles at that time. Basically, you can take those particles. Obviously, the metal, the, the gold coating that we use is not going to be magnetic but one can deposit iron. And when you apply magnetic field, uh, you're going to have magnetic interactions between the iron half of the particles. There is one more fundamental difference between electrical field and magnetic field, which we did not discuss. So let's see who is going to come up. So imagine that the next slide, you have not seen them yet. Um, Imagine that I want to distinguish another effect which is not going to be present in electrical field here. 
what kind of additional effect can you think about when you have uh, this type of magnetic particles, which is not going to occur with electric particles? Is it the reversibility? Uh -huh. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. This is exactly this is exactly what I was looking for. So, when you have magnetic fields, if you take a kind of like polarizable object that is magnetic material and bring it inside magnetic field, you are going to have magnetic dipole that remains in the particle. Right? Uh, essentially, you bring a magnetic particle next to a magnet, and you are going to have. A, a, small magnet within the particles. When you remove the magnet, the, the magnetized particle is going to remain magnetic and it's still going to interact with the other particles. Interestingly, if you're depositing a thin metal layer, uh, you can actually have two cases. You can have a residual or non-residual magnetic polarization. If the magnetic domains are very small, they do not keep residual mag mag magnetic polarization. So you turn on the field, the particles interact. You turn off the fuels, the particles stop interacting and disassemble. Uh, this uh, such type of particles are called uh, super uh, super uh, uh, ferromagnetic. Um, we do not. Uh, we, we have investigated both cases. So when we started investigating these cases, we found out that we can have two cases. Um, you can have even different types of structures depending on what is the thickness of the magnetic coating that we deposit on the particles. Uh, so they uh, either form structures which remain assembled uh, or they form structures where they break off inside the magnetic field and this can be investigated by using the magnetic polarizability of those particles um, which Natasha and uh, Lillian are doing routinely these days with regards to their particles which I'm going to show a little bit further on. So once we establish that we also establish that the particles, when, uh, when they assemble and if they have residual polarization, are going to form those chains, but these chains will be preserved if you turn off the field because you're still having the magnets interacting between the genus halves of the particles. And then now that this these chains are going to uh, start um, um, uh, kind of like, I mean, being able to wind around, uh, they're going to adopt different configurations they can kind of uh, move themselves around. So essentially you have the formation of uh, flexible magnetically assembled chains just by applying the magnetic field, assembling the particles and turning it off. Uh, you kind of like, I mean, have embedded magnetic uh, moments within those particles. Um, interestingly, we can even reverse the process because now if you apply, if you apply a device called the magnetizer and uh, those of you who may have used, so today, of course, we all use uh, LCD or uh, LED monitors, uh, but the previous monitors, the so-called CRT, the big monitors, when you turn them off the first time, um, you hear kind of this strong sound, bzz, kind of for a kind of few seconds. Uh, this sound is because those monitors, in order to reproduce the colors correctly, needed to be demagnetized every time they are turned on. So there is a device called demagnetizer, demagnetizer coil, coil, which demagnetizes the monitor to keep the colors clean because you have ele electrons flying around and they have to hit the right place. Um, so this device actually can be used as means of uh, um, turning around the interactions with the particle system. You assemble them by magnetic field they stay assembled, uh, then they have those flexible chains, you turn on the demagnetization uh, the field and then they disassemble again. This is a very interesting property which our group and other groups have not exploited much further uh, and uh, we intend to investigate it potentially as part of our future research uh, in terms of making magnetically reversible uh, type of structures. So something that we had like found out earlier uh, but still um, uh, kind of have to investigate in an interesting perspective because you really turn on, on and off the uh, assembly that you have initiated to the magnetic field. Um, so uh, again, I, I kind of, sorry for asking you questions, but uh, we, we wanted to have this interactive. So you're an investigator. Uh, so the year is 2009. Um, by then people already work with genus particles. You want to be one step one head of, of ahead of, uh, of the research at that, sta at that, sta at that stage. Um, what will be the next fundamentally different perspective that you can introduce inside a field like that? So you want to build on complexity, right? You say, okay, so first I have complex fields, now I have more complex particles uh, with 
let's say, asym asymmetry within the particle. How can you bring up this to one level more complex structures with more complex interactions at that time? If you have a different uh, geometry of the particle, like a sphere uh -huh. versus a cube versus a prism versus a cylinder. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Kana. Um, I mean, essentially, you can say now we want to investigate what, uh, uh, what kind of uh, um, additional contribution to the whole process is going to be brought forward by um, having a special shape of the particles. So um, this is when we started making particles a special shape. Uh, in this case, what you, what you can see here, our first report on microcubes and microcylinders, which are made by a relatively simple process on, on the scale of microfabrication. Uh, it's photolithography. Uh, you, uh, I mean, you take a wafer, coat it with uh, uh, photoresist, uh, shine light with, with kind of through a mask, and then you can have cylinders or cubes. So you can make those uh, these are polymer particles. Unfortunately, the scale bar is lost here, but this is 20 micron scale bar. Uh, so now we have particles. You can, of course, call them symmetrically, but that is not the point, because now you can also um, uh, induce additional asymmetry by coating only one side of those particles uh, with metal. So now you have, if you would imagine this, so now you have your particle, but the, ma but the magnet is on one side of the particle. It is not within within the within the central area of the particle, but it is on one side. So you can think of uh, now having two types of particles, each having its magnet on one side. What is shown here is how those particles are going to interact. So first of all, they're going to align each other, then the magnets start interacting. This magnet will be facing in that direction, as you'd imagine. And, and now we have the two magnets coming together, and then now you're going to have the interaction between those magnets plus the additional constrictions um, uh, of the interactions that are being driven by the shape, right? So they can come like that, they can come like that, but they cannot come in, in any other direction, which makes it um, uh, very interesting fundamentally because now the additional interactions allow us to make different types of motile uh, and uh, magnetically responsive structures. So uh, what follows next is I'm going to go through kind of like what we are doing right now, kind of like research that continues to date uh, on special type of structures. How can you assemble microcubes? How can you make ultra soft filaments? And how, how can you make three-dimensionally printed magnetically responsive materials? So um, kind of I have finished the background and now kind of I go, it's going towards the research that eventually continues today in the group. Let me check for any questions or comments here. By the way, if you have any, please don't hesitate to kind of raise a hand or drop a note. Um, Orlan, okay. uh -huh. you just made a demonstration with your two little pieces of paper. Could mm -hmm. you explain what you meant when you say they can come together this way, but not that way? Can you? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I actually like to have, uh, unfortunately, the magnetic particles that we use, we actually have microcubes with magnets attached to them. And whoever can come to my office when the, my office is open to visitors, I uh, will be welcome to take a look at those models that were made by Kuhi. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll show this in a drawing, in, in a kind of like in a hands-on, uh, at least drawing okay. like very soon. Let me actually do that. And I'm going to show have you how some of those microcubes in the group office if someone wants to play with them. Yeah, anybody who wants to play with, play with the microcubes is very welcome. I'm drawing the dipoles here. But if you think of some questions, let me know. I will show those dipoles the moment when I come to showing some experimental data. I'm going to show you also how it works. Uh, so you have to imagine how magnetic fields operate. So um, in, in terms of uh, background of this research, uh, I, have to, uh, I have to mention the following, and uh, this is essentially why we really like to kind of stick our heads out, try a few new things, because if you do new things and if you keep your eyes open, you can really discover new 
interesting elements that eventually will be a fundamental importance. Um, so we have to confess that when we were making those particles, we were just saying, okay, so let's see how they're going to interact and assemble, right? We did not, we could not predict what we, what we found out later and what we assembled in microbots and active particles and all kinds of structures that I'm going to show later. But the fact that we were thinking ahead of, uh, ahead of the field at that time of what asymmetric particles can bring, special shape particles, allowed us to perform the research later on. So once we had those particles, we put them together, now we apply magnetic fields, they assemble. Uh, and, and suddenly you find out interesting things that can happen uh, when you have those cubic particles. This is the Janus particles that I showed previously. They form chains that they can bend around very freely. What happens with the magnetic particles is illustrated here and then I'm going to analyze it. These are structures, again, like in an experimental cell that we use, each of those particles is, uh, is 10 micrometers in size. So now we, uh, and, and the magnetic parts are here because they assemble like magnets next to each other. So now when we turn the field on and off, we have the prototype of a structure that we still have to be investigating and is part of our ongoing research, uh, which uh, would be called uh, microparticle origami. So this is a self, also self-shaping uh, uh, origami or self-folding origami. So the structure can turn itself on and off, can reconfigure inside the, inside the magnetic field. This comes from the magnetic particles. So now this is where you kind of like the interactions are going to come handy. So I'm going to explain them next. Uh, before anything else, I would like to kind of start with a simple origami, just to illustrate how this works again. And, and, and what happens uh, and then analyze it. So you have a small chamber. You apply the magnetic field. The particles are going to orient, first they're going to orient themselves in the direction of the magnetic field, uh, because if you, have a, if you have a dipole and if you have a field, so the polarizable particle is going to orient itself in the direction of the field. Um, and then they're going to start interacting with each other and assemble. So this is what it looks like. Again, these are particles, 10 micrometers. You cannot see the magnetic side, which is facing up, but that's why we have the drawing here. And this is an example of uh, how my student at that uh, time, uh, who he kind of really managed to visualize this very nicely. Uh, so we turn on the field. We see that the particles orient themselves. Then they're coming together in some type of structure. This here schematic, which is timed with the movie, illustrates what goes on. So all the magnetic, um, the, 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 the small magnets have already themselves in the same direction, but you can see that some are facing up, some are facing down. This is, I hope that you can see on the camera, the magnetic, magnetic dipoles that I'm showing, uh, that I'm showing here. So you have a magnet here, you have an, another magnet, they may do this. Uh, or they may do something like that. But if they do something like that, now if you imagine those magnets are also interacting with their other sides, so if they do this, then they would also like to do this. In, in which case you are doubling the interaction, right? This is one north-south interacting and this is two north-south interacting together. So you can have two different types of interactions, either this way in which they, they, they stick and they cannot move around anymore, or you can have one of them doing this and then flipping around. If you, if you let them flip, they're going to flip together. I'll show this on the next slide. If you do not let them flip, this move illustrates what is the most, uh, the most interesting and fascinating things. What happened is now all this structure is going to be opening and closing its say spontaneously every time we turn the field on and off. Um, so you have a microscopic uh, self-reconfiguring microbot prototype, if you will, and I'll show how this works. Um, but uh, first we want to analyze it. I mentioned the two flipping dipoles, the two flipping magnets. Here an example of the magnets that do not flip, which we denote as AB. And here is the AA structure, which, um, uh, which later on is going to flip around. It is going to minimize its energy. It is going to minimize its energy so much uh, 
um, uh, it is going to minimize its energy so much that uh, then it can no, you cannot get it out of that uh, of that configuration <laughs> because if you have the magnet stick stick in this way then you, it's very hard to pull them apart so we better not let them stick like that because this is irreversible assembly with very strong interaction which you don't want we want them to interact in a way that is reversible um, I see a question of how long does it take for the this structure to assemble in the previous slide. This is uh, you can uh, this is real time movie, so it, it does it very quickly, right? All of those assembly and, and motion are pretty quick. This is one good thing about magnetic interactions is that they are strong and fast. Um, I had actually one other question that yeah. kind of goes along with that question. So if you increase the strength of the magnetic field, does that make the assembly happen faster? It would, yes. Okay. Only Thank thing you. is then you have to use larger electromagnets and high current. Right. So there are experimental limitations to that. But this is the good thing about magnetic fields is that, uh, I mean, you can control the interactions very easily. You just control it with the current. And, and I'll show you what happens when you flip the current and when you do this response destruction. But now, so now we have these two, these two magnets stick together. So you let them do this again. Um, if you let them do this, uh, they are not going to come apart in any magnetic field. It's a symmetric, very strong uh, configuration. But then you can do something like that when you have now, this is the so-called steric interaction coming into play. So now when you start turning the field on and off, these magnets would want to rearrange, but they cannot stick into this very deep energy minimum configuration because these other particles are standing in the way. Um, you can have a formation of more uh, this structure. So if you, if you use the notation that we said BBAA in terms of where they're facing, this structure would be called ABBA and then you have the dancing particles. Um, usually kind of like with uh, more senior uh, audience, kind of like this invokes kind of some interesting reminiscences. Uh, you can ask Dr. Genzer what he thinks about uh, ABBA. Uh, as a dancing, uh, well, the music about the dancing, uh, the dancing queen, or in this case, the dancing particles. Um, but the point here is that um, what, what we're showing is uh, that we have this um, reconfigurable type of structure. And now that we have that we want to, we can assemble the structure, we can play with it. Um, I want to mention that uh, we had a great help uh, when we were making that research. Uh, so an undergraduate researcher um, uh, who was uh, studying uh, robotics, come to join our group at that time for an ARIO project in the summer. And, uh, and she was great, and uh, maybe some of you know her. Being online now, so, so Nidhi also at that stage contributed as an undergraduate researcher to this study, and is a co-author of the paper. So, um, of course, when we uh, when we investigate structures like that, you can play with kind of some cool uh, type of uh, process, but you also want to understand the fundamentals. Uh, we have been working also, and, and I'm not showing much of this data, on modeling of the interactions in kind of, uh, in, in this case, it's explicit model by using the package called console. So this is an example of how we can do a microbot which captures a light itself. And this is an example of the strength of the, of the magnetic field, which we have calculated in the same configurations, which explain what you're seeing on the top, right? So here you see the cool process of a microbot, which captures a life itself, and then drive the cell. All of this is driven by the magnetic field. So know that we have two different processes. We can open and close the microbot, and, and we can drag it around. So this is one, one, this is again, I, you know, I kind of like these days when I'm teaching online, I, uh, online, I'm offering lots of virtual candy for people who could kind of immediately give me an answer. But um, how this does this correlate to what I'm showing here uh, in terms of fundamentals, how does this correlate to the very first slide that I showed about the two type of interactions that one can find in similar systems? or how are the two types of interactions that I mentioned on the very first slide, remember with the chains and the magnetophoretic or electrophoretic, uh, dielectrophoretic assembly, how does this relate to what I'm showing here? So would the DEP be sort of analogous to dragging 
the microbot huh? around, whereas the dipolar chaining would be an opening and closing. Exactly, right? So essentially, you can independently vary the strength of the field, which is going to lead to opening and closing, and the gradient. So we can just put a, put a few magnets, uh, and, and we can not only use the gradient to drag the particles, but you can use the strength to open and close. So essentially, we have decoupled the two, the two interactions in order to move the thing around and then opening and closing it. Uh, these days, there is a, this is a very uh, kind of like strongly developing field. The, uh, some of the leading researchers in the world, like in places such as uh, EPFL, for example, uh, in, 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 uh, in Switzerland and, and many of the leading institutions, uh, researchers in microrobotics are doing magnetic manipulation of microbots. But uh, our microbots are really the first one that you can not only move around, so they have this very complex configuration of magnets, so you can put a human head inside, and then you can put a microbot in the eye and move it around in order to do microsurgery of the eye. You can find this online. Uh, very interesting research. I mean, I've been fascinated. I got to meet that investigator, actually, uh, in the last international trip that I have had this year, before everything closed down. Uh, but um, in our case, we're really investigating the fundamentals rather than trying to do microsurgery with some kind of very cool device. Um, any other questions or comments here? And then uh, okay. what I want to show I, is, uh -huh. go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Like, uh, like if the energy of one configuration is the minimum, then why the, like these self-assemblies are going to different configurations? Um, in this case, what happens is the following. So essentially, you can see with a strong field, the open configuration is going to be the one that minimizes the energy. And when you turn the field off, the folded configuration, so this is the fundamental aspect. You can think of this as magnets interacting, but essentially, the, the, uh, if you calculate the energy of the structure here, the open configuration is going to be the configuration with minimal energy when you have the strong field on. And when you turn the field off, then you only have the internal interaction here. And now the energy is minimized, minimized when it falls. That's why essentially, if you want to understand the complex structure like that, and want to be completely explicit, that is understand everything, you really need to model all the field configuration and then you find out the energy of the structure. And I'll show you how you do this also in the, in the case of hydrodynamics. And again, we are using computational package here. Um, but uh, you can really uh, look for the magnetic energy of the structure. So you can say magnetic energy here is minimized and magnetic energy here is, is, is minimized. The difference between those two cases is, of course, the presence and the absence of the field. No. So in the last slide, that the two configurations that you have shown, that ABBA and uh -huh. ABB. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so these two configurations have the same uh, energy levels or like is it different like uh, that's a good question we haven't checked exactly what is the configuration of energy i would think that this and this the, the difference in energy here is probably a little bit larger um but part of the interesting com like i mean like something which is interesting related to this question if you, if you go further is the following so now what if you take many of those and if you can assemble this configuration versus this configuration on a large scale yes. and put it inside the material and then apply the magnetic field. So now we are going to be inserting energy inside the material that holds these assemblies. Yeah. <laughs> so if you think about this, this is also the reason why we right now we are wanting to investigate this on a larger scale. And this would kind of give me the opportunity to actually go to the next slide, show something which I hope would be uh, an inspiration for the, for the researcher who is going to be working between uh, my group and the group of Professor Hall. So this is some data we, I do not think we even have reported it in a publication at that time, which was obtained while we're playing with these structures. What you see here is, well, this is one single chain and you can see here that you have, we call it trans configuration and cis configuration, if you will. Um, and here you can see more chains about that. And now we start turning the field on and off and just look what happens. You have this very long chain, which has been assembled and which suddenly starts extending and compressing itself in the field. So every time you turn the field on and off, you have this very large origami structure, which kind of self-reconfigures. Uh, now the question is, how can you make 
how can you make special origami on a large scale in a, in a reproducible way? So then you can, you would know how much a structure like that, not now what happened. Now you have this humongous origami, which still kind of extends and contracts, right? So you can think of this as micro muscle, if you will. Uh, how, uh, how would you have this kind of like very large origami uh, be manipulated? And first of all, what is the concentration as was mentioned here? What is the concentration of particles and their organization uh, that would allow to assemble large scale origami as compared to something which is not as responsive? So uh, this is part of the fundamental questions that we have yet to answer. And you, you could imagine that kind of like uh, waiting for for such a structure to assemble itself just by occasionally is not really a very efficient way of doing research that's why you need modeling because if we model different types of structures then we can go towards the right uh, the right assembly conditions as fast as possible and and then have something which is interesting and manipulatable uh, i'm going to let this kind of like move like i mean self respond here while I'm answering a question here. Does the medium in which the particles are suspending have an influence? Um, not for the case of magnetic particles, right? It has very important influence for the case of electrically driven active structures, which uh, I think Nidhi has found by, by now quite well. Uh, the presence of electrolyte changes the electrostatic interactions, but not so much the magnetic interactions. One thing that we do not want to have here is you do not want to have sticking of the particles by other interactions, which inter interferes. So we make sure that they do not stick to each other by using non-ionic surfactant uh, in order to prevent uh, Van der Waals sticking of the particles. We like Van der Waals in our other projects where we, where we have the, the, uh, the, the big um, uh, particles, the soft and dirty coils that will stick to anything. But in this case, we do not want, like Van der Waals because it's going to disrupt the reorganization of the structure. So thank you, Yuk. Okay, um, so now just kind of a, a little bit on the background and kind of a little bit of the introduction of uh, the seminar that I would recommend to everybody here. Uh, coming up on Monday uh, with an excellent uh, colleague and uh, a long friend of mine, uh, Professor Peter Vlachowska from Northwestern University. Uh, what, uh, so we, we say, okay, so now all this, the hot, the hot research these days is active particles, particles that are going to move around. You're going to hear about her fundamental research on Monday. Uh, but then the question is, how do you define an active particles in the first place, right? Uh, so now that, uh, so now I mentioned that uh, you can have magnetic field and then the particles is going to attract and stick, right? Or, or if I just let this pointer drop, it moves. Is this an active particle or not, right? Just the motility itself is not something that defines an active particle. Um, we believe that one of the definitions that explains it well, kind of like some years ago when this field was just kind of like, I mean, uh, was getting started, um, uh, an opinion paper actually be, uh, written by, um, uh, together with a colleague who is actually a copy of the other project that I was mentioning, the project on microplastics collection, Nick Abbott. So we even, uh, kind of like described essentially the active particles as ones where you have local conversion of the external energy as means of moving it around. If you have a boat, and if that boat moves with the, with the current, or if you tie, a, uh, if you tie a, a rope and pull the boat, that is not an active boat, right? But if you, if you put a motor on the boat and create the propulsion locally, which fundamentally means that you are going to have a local conversion of the energy into motile uh, energy. This is an active type of particle. There are, this is a very interesting topic, which I would love to discuss with you, maybe in another tutorial. I just want to show how one can make active particles out of those magnetically responsive structures that we have. So can we make, can we take a structure like that? Uh, I'm sure that many of you know the answer, but I still like to kind of have some dialogue here. Um, can we have this uh, structure of the, uh, uh, this is the ABBA structure, which opens and closes like this and make a microscopic fish by, you know, like, I mean, how, like, or, or microscopic octopus. So you do this, right? Kind of open it and close it and make it float around. Can you do this or not? Is it easy or is it not easy? I see Austin is. Um, 
using a shear thickening or shear uh, thinning fluid as the medium? Ah, yeah, you jumped one, one, one step ahead, right? I mean, in water. Okay, in water, I think it'd be difficult. <laughs> well, so there is a so-called scallop theorem, which still which, 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 so that if you have a scallop on a microscopic scale, and if, if you put it in regular fluid, so you can open it and close it with any reasonable rate that you like, but you're not going to have net propulsion. It's amazing, but the thing is going to really, because of the laminar nature of the flow on the micro scale, the, th the thing is going to be, so it moves every time you open and close it, but the, uh, but the rate of motion is going to, that's not the rate of motion, but the distance of travel is going to be exactly the same. So the thing is going to do what is illustrated here. It, it will be going up and down a little bit, but it is not going to have net motion. People have, however, have proposed a means of manipulating objects like that on the micro scale. So we have tried that and it really goes nowhere as much as you try to do it. Um, we have investigated how one can use it, uh, a fluid, like well, Austin kind of like jumped ahead a little bit here. You can use a shear thinning or shear thickening fluid. And the rate of opening and closing now is going to result in different motion because the response of that fluid depends on how quickly you shear it, how quickly you open and close the uh, thingy. So now the thingy is going to move. Uh, you can say, okay, so that's a nice fish, micro fish, nice to report it. But there is even more interesting aspects of those fishes. These are the uh, assemblies of two sizes. Exactly the same particles, exactly the same field, exactly the same medium. But look what happens. And this is how we open and close them. Here we do this by symmetric field. We open them and close them at the same rate. Not surprisingly, those fishes, you can see them jumping up a little bit down, up and down, right? You can see it here, but they stay in place. But now we, when you start actuating them with asymmetric field, so suddenly you see all those fish start to move. And they not only start to move, but then they move in different directions. This microfish moves in this direction when you slow open into the rapid closing, this moves in the other direction. And when we turn around the type of actuation, then they go in the other direction. So, uh, yes, you have the fish moving, but they are the micro fish, if you will, but then they're moving in different directions. Why would they do that? Well, now we have to analyze this in more detail, again, using COMSO, which I'm going to show on the next slide. But uh, let me check for questions on, uh, or answers here. Well, that is questions or comments. Um, explaining why those microfishes make this is a little bit more complex. Uh, actually, we call this, uh, this makes a nice kind of like fundamentally, <laughs> fundamentally uh, interesting name. So we call this a, what we have proposed and verified is called, we call it coupled scallop hypothesis. Essentially, when you look at the fish like that, you can actually see that it consists of two micro scallops. One is the big scallop that is here when it opens and closes, but then you also have one small scallop here. So you're essentially having two scallops which try to push its, themselves against each other. Um, so the scallop on the, the scallop on the top is pushing downwards and the scallop on the bottom is pushing upwards. So now if you start those scalps, so you can see these are the area of high shear. Again, this is a console simulation. In this case of the energy dissipation, this is the friction within the medium. So you can do that simulation and you can see how you have one area of very high shear here, and then you have another area of, high shear, of, of not so high shear here. Here, you have area of high shear also, but the area of a small shear are very widely distributed. So you have a very big area of small shear around and area of high, a small area of high shear here, but overall the area of high shear on the bottom, that is low shear on the bottom, big area, low shear on the bottom, is overriding the high shear on the top. So we can do a console simulation of the energy dissipation inside systems like that, and then we can understand uh, how the uh, how such tra uh, structures are going to move. This is a paper that we just uh, published this year in Line Muir in a special issue. Uh, you can check it out for more details. I really, this goes a little bit outside the magnetic interactions here. Um, I just want to show a couple of more applications of the microbots. Uh, 
if you want to have something like that, you are going, you, in effect, you have created a micro-rheometer. So the stuff that you do in a big rheometer where you are measuring the viscosity or the energy dissipation inside uh, large scale systems such as a gel, now we can do it on the micro scale. So then the question is, okay, so <laughs> you have a micro rheometer, what can you investigate with this micro rheometer? One very common, the, the most common and the most important answer to that, which we actually have started investigating is what? What is the really small microscopic object that is really worth investigating in terms of rheometry? We actually started investigating it together with a colleague from Germany. As a high value, what is the highest value microscopic structure that you can investigate by using a micro rheometer? Anything biological, right? You can take a live cell and you can squish it and check out what is the rheological response of the cell, right? By measuring how stiff the cells are, you can actually measure their life status uh, or, or, or measure whether they are sick. Maybe where, whether they have been infected by a virus, but that's another matter. Um, uh, we, we have been investigating cells like that. We had some research uh, which we have not finished. Um, something that we have finished again with our collaborator, who is also a collaborator on the microplastics project, is using liquid crystals. Liquid crystals uh, have um, very special organization on the micro scales because of their molecular interactions and the interactions with surfaces. We could calibrate those microbots by using viscous fluids and measuring how quickly they open and close. So we can calibrate the force with which they open, like small micro pincers. And then we have investigated by looking at liquid crystals. We have investigated the structure of the liquid crystals and the response of liquid crystals to different forces. It's a very interesting and very important fundamental problem, which we have discussed in a paper which also appeared this year. So essentially, you can see how once we start with the topic, we really kind of move on and investigate new areas and apply it to certain system of interest together with in, in kind of good collaborators, academic collaborators in the department or outside. And, uh, and, and ideally can uh, make some good academic research coming up. So this is so, so much about what I wanted to tell the, the microbots. I don't want to make this group meeting. Sometimes they are long, but they, that may be the case when we have practice talks. I don't want to make it too long. I will just show a few slides off now about the other type of magnetic structures that we're investigating, kind of in, in terms of over, over, overview of the group activity. Um, but let me check for questions or comments here that relate to the microcubes. Uh, this is also a new project that we're offering as a graduate research project. Um, very interesting fundamental topics. Uh, active structures and active particles are interesting. And what we want in this case is to combine active motility with assembly of totally new type of structures. So let me check for any questions here. And, and then I'll kind of have a quick uh, overview of the other research topics that we have. Yeah, so I have a question. Like, I couldn't really understand why the velocity of the microbots were changing with the length of the particles or the size of the particles. Um, you mean the 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 uh, the, the motion, or the direction of motion, or yeah. here with yeah. the liquid crystals? No, in the the variation of the motion. So I saw that that the velocity of the particles are different for different length size. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't really understand like why that is happening. I guess it should remain right. the same. Yeah, Depending that's a very good question. Let me, uh, I'm sorry for being a little bit kind of like uh, short on the explanations here. I mean, that's okay. uh, so let me kind of like, I mean, try to explain the following way. If you, uh, so you have a non, uh, non Newtonian fluid. So essentially, when you start moving in a fluid, the resistance of that fluid is, the, is like I mean, a typical fluid would be linear, right? The faster you press, the, the more resistance it has. Non-Newtonian fluid has variable resistance, right? It is going to resist strongly when you shear it strongly, and it is going to resist less when you shear it less. That is, um, I mean, it is going to uh, push against the object that, that pushes it. At a different strength, depending on what is the so-called energy dissipation, depending on how much you are sharing it. So, in order to understand that, we can take a model here and we can say, let's calculate the rate of shear. What is making the liquid push against the microbot? 
So this is what happens here. You see how the microbot shears the fluid. So the fluid pushes the microbot more strongly here. You can see it pushes here and here. And this is large area. So this is not very, very brightly covered. That is very red covered. So this means that the shear stress here is not too high, but it is very large area, right? On the other hand, if you take a small microbot, you see very strong shear here and weak shear here. So you can say the liquid pushes very strongly against the microbot here, but once it kind of comes together, the area that is that that is pushing the in the other in the opposite direction. So this pushes in one direction, it pushes in the other direction, right? It's kind of the coupled scalp. So the, uh, what, what happens to push here is not as strong as what happens to push here and this is not as large. What happens here is you still have a very strong push here, but you have humongous push on this side. So essentially the overall resistance here is higher on, on that side of the microbot and here it's higher on this side of the microbot. So this is essentially the resistance the microbot encounters and this resistance is going to determine how far it's going to move in one direction or the other. So in the, uh, like in the first figure, the resistance is kind of dissipated over the entire surface area, right? Over this big surface area, right? Yeah, yeah. So it is high here, but even though it is lower here, it is dissipated over this big surface, uh, surface area. Right. In this case, you only have a little bit of resistance here when they touch each other, but there is right. very high resistance on that scale here. So then the overall, the balance of the resistance is top and bottom is different. So the two scalps are, are kind of like exhibiting different resistance. That's what makes this move. Uh, so uh, we have seen lots of interest in this work. Um, again, I think that over time people are going to kind of like, I mean, get very interested in these topics. It's an ongoing research area in many groups worldwide, not kind of coupled scallops, but kind of microscopic moving motile particles are object of big research as kind of needy who also does research on electrically motile particles knows. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a topic that kind of like is from our And one more question, uh -huh. like like in the previous slide, one slide back. So the velocity that you have shown is it the velocity of the entire microbot or is it the velocity of one particle? Um, so yeah, in both this cases, one. this is one part. This is one particle. We just changed the actuating field. Uh, it wouldn't start properly. Um, so this, so so we are observing one large and much more particle and where it goes. Symmetric field, they don't go anywhere. Asymmetric field, yes. one goes up, the other one goes down and so on. Yeah. yeah. So for the second figure, as you can see, like the particles are like changing the direction and also um, moving downwards. So like, this one is moving you... downwards, this one is moving up, right? Yeah. 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 So the right, right picture. So I guess it's, yeah, uh -huh. this, uh, this one. So in this case, the particle like is kind of going up, like it's changing the each microbot uh, like each cubes is changing the direction and like it's going up. So is it the velocity taken into account for one cube or is it the like velocity of the entire microbot? Yeah, the velocity of the entire microbot. I mean, like we have actually kind of like, I mean, constructed here, what we have plotted in the paper is the velocity of this midpoint here. Um, okay. And again, the reason they are moving up and down, same microbot moving up and down is because, uh, I mean, it's, it's a little bit hard to see in the movies, but in this case, it's slowly opening and rapidly closing. And in the other case, it's rapidly closing and slowly opening. Just to kind of like, so, so this illustrates our power to control the magnetic field that brings them together. Uh, and, and that power is electronically, and it's not very complex electronics, uh, it is electronically controlled because we can program the, the electromagnets to, let's say, increase their field uh, quickly or increase their field strong, uh, slowly, right? So essentially by controlling the current in the, in the electromagnet, we're controlling what happens in the system. This is very important also with regards to the type of structures that can be assembled because imagine now we want to say, okay, so how do we assemble the type of structures that we like? Let's say structures where we have most kinks in, in the chain, so these kinks then make it open and close fast, right? So if we, want to, if we want to assemble that structure, there is one more component that we can change. It is the strength of the field that we change over time, right? So to put it in another way, do we turn on very strong interactions immediately? So we disperse them. And then we say interact immediately with the strongest, in the, with the strongest way possible. 
or do we say let's start let's let's start increasing the interaction slowly and then they can move around the three range and then we increase the interaction so they stick right so we can imagine that there is another thing that we can model theoretically unfortunately dr hall had to go but uh, I mean, Mike Matt can tell her about that maybe, but we, we can essentially turn on the interactions with, with control rate. And by turning the interactions with control rate, we can, let's say, make the following. If we turn them we immediately, they say stick like that in every any configuration, right? Yes. If we slowly increase them, then they can kind of approach each other and then we can turn it off even if necessary. So then we can do a kind of a kneeling of the structure during the assembly and then assemble another type of structure, right? So this is, these are capabilities that few, if kind of any other groups have realized yet. And this is kind of like essentially gives us fundamental, uh, I would say fundamental uh, advantage right now to, to making some good progress that other people are going to appreciate in the future. Okay. Um, as, as much as I love this discussion, uh, let me, Kind of also tell a little bit about other ongoing topics and uh, some of the background of the research in my group. Uh, I, I think this is also useful for the group members, also for our guests, uh, also for our collaborators, such as Matt. Um, so this is the microcube story. Um, we have been working on um, uh, particles that are connected with liquid bridges. Uh, we, we have both Natasha and Lilia working in this field right now. Originally, we discussed uh, this topic by assembling magnetic particles coated with liquid, in this case, lipid, uh, which is liquid at room temperature. So this is, um, uh, I mean, we have been proud and have been explaining about that, kind of like people have been fascinated. Um, if you want to publish a paper in a journal such as Nature Materials, you really need to have something that is cutting edge, right? And sometimes people tend, tend to think in terms of something very complex uh, <laughs> and very hard to make. So here we have taken the three simplest nanomaterials or materials in general that you can find in a lab. We have taken uh, magnetic nanoparticles, fatty acid, that is you know, <laughs> oil and water, and we have assembled the structure and we have reported it in Nature Materials, the cutting edge of research, just because we have kept our open, our eyes open, and we have been investigating what the interesting type of structure that formed. So what we found out is that if we take, if we take magnetic, uh, magnetic particles, which are coated with lipid, and we apply magnetic field, they stick together, and then we have an extremely so soft and flexible structure. This is shown in the next movie. So this is actually magnetic particles bound by a little bit of oil and then we start rotating the field and then they start flipping around and these are very soft new type of soft material very soft structures that are bound by lip by liquid so these are liquid bound nanostructures they have been a big interest to many people um, the interaction in this case is the so-called capillary interaction um, i was exposed to this type of interaction many years ago when I was a graduate student in a leading colloidal group in Bulgaria, um, where some of the researchers were really good in writing formulas. Um, so actually, um, so now the academicians, uh, but uh, some of more senior researchers were actually writing the formulas of calculating interactions uh, between particles and liquid. But we use them in this case to bind lipid nanoparticles. The thing about binding st things with liquid is that actually a liquid bridge makes particles stick very strongly but it's still liquid and this it can still be moved around. So if you stick to two particles with a little bit of liquid, they're going to stay together and you can rearrange it. Um, um, uh, the PhD candidates uh, in my group, uh, Natasha and Lillian, like to show this in kind of like the example of uh, how sand castle, right? Sand castle is the type of structure that you can make in this way. Um, and it is also reconfigurable if you dry out the sand and then you can make another castle by just putting some liquid. Um, what we have done out of it, first we have characterized the flexibility. It's an immensely flexible structure, one of the softest structures that kind of have been reported in the literature, or if not the soft, the, the softest. Uh, I won't go into details here, just kind of give a little bit of an idea. It is also self-repairing on, on the micro scale as shown here. Under the microscope, you can break those magnetic chains. They're bound by liquid. Liquid, if you break it, it doesn't kind of like I mean, stay broken. 
you apply the magnetic field, they come back together and stick together. So this is how you make a self-repairing material out of magnetic nanoparticles and, and lipid. You can use the lipid to stick together genus particles. This is a very nice paper. Again, JAX is a very good journal, uh, written together with Dr. Hall's group because Dr. Hall's group did simulations of how genus particles will stick and form different types of structures. I do not have the um, um, fundamental aspects uh, illustrated here, but it has some very nice modeling involved from Dr. Hall's group explaining how those, those structures form. And again, people loved it because they, you can see new science and some uh, fundamental interpretation. Uh, if you're interested, you can take a look at that paper. In terms of collaboration, I mentioned that we love to collaborate with, with other leading researchers. This is collaboration with Dr. Tracy's group, where we have shown how one can take such particle structures, um, polymerize the medium, in this case, make a, a, a soft silicone material uh, containing uh, chains of particles. So now you have those, those, those uh, uh, silicone, that is uh, elastomeric material, which has chain particles. A magnetic chain is more polarizable in the direction of the chain than in the opposite direction. You can imagine why, right? Because now the magnet is from here to here and otherwise it's just in this size. So because of this, we can have these magnetic structures which have very, so you, you look at the magnetic film. It is uniformly, uh, it contains particles on uniform scale. But here, um, so let's see what is the, what is the, in this movie we're turning on, let me go back a little bit so it can play properly. In this movie we're turning on the field and it kind of contracts and, and expands the harmonica thing. There is something which kind of is unique about this X uh, or cross-shaped structure here. So you can see that this it goes by the magnet. So this flap is not attracted to the magnet and this flap is attracted. And then the other one would not be attracted, just passes by. And then this one will be attracted again. The reason is that the chains, and of course this is the same material all over, but the chains in this case are oriented, you can see the black, uh, uh, the black lines here, they're oriented in this direction. So the ones where the chains are facing the magnet would be very strongly polarizable. And the ones where the chains are not facing the magnet would not respond as strongly, right? So this is how you make a, a prototype of a, of a soft actuator with, if you like, programmed response, right? Because it, it would respond in different, to the direction of the field, even though it's a uniform field, field because of the internal structure that we have organized by, it is going to respond in different ways the, to, the, to the magnetic field. So in principle, we can program this to respond to different fields in different ways, right? Uh, this is research that we published with Dr. Tracy's group some time ago. We're collaborating with him in a number of projects, one of which I'm going to show next. Uh, any questions or comments here? <laughs> so these are the these are the spherical chains of like the Janus sphere kind of chains. These are just simple chains actually. This was work that was done some time ago. So at that time, we were just working with simple particles, right? We did not we had not reached this level of complexity as to date. So now the question is: Imagine that you can make particles with special shapes and put them in the materials like that. Now you are going to have additional constraints depending on how you assemble them depending on whether the chains can expand or collapse, then the whole material will try to expand or collapse or, or bend or, or shape itself, right? So this is uh, essentially the uniform structure and the non-uniform structure of such type of materials we have not done yet, but we would like to do it in the new project. This is just simple magnetic particles. And even with simple magnetic particles, we have interesting structure. Speaking of simple magnetic particles and organized chains, uh, Natasha from my, uh, from my group, um, uh, she's right now mostly spending her time on an internship, um, but she has been uh, uh, the group member to synthesize those silicon microspheres with organized chains. Now you can have a toolbox of, all, of, uh, of particles that interact, silicon particles that interact in different directions. They can interact with magnetic uh, interactions or, or capillary interactions. Uh, 
then uh, what Natasha could do was essentially this would be a dream for modeling um, uh, people because here you can see actually real time what happens when you have magnetically so this is like a soft magnet right you have magnetic chains they have polarization they keep their their directional uh, um, uh, interactions so you take them and you just shake them up a little bit you break off the structure and then this is the formation essentially what you're looking here is the uh, process which we call gelation so you can see the magnetic chains organizing and then even you have a uh, senior resist for those some of you have who have played with gel have seen that effect also so this is essentially a model of a magnetic gel on a macro macro scale that where the particles that the Natasha has made first of all they chain into the in in in, in into the, the the directions so they form a gel and second of all these gels because the particles also interact side to side like the magnets can interact this way but they can also interact a little bit this way so then it roughens and releases some of the water so this is all all, all those processes happen in real molecular gels this is a colloidal gel of all the special particles and again you, you can imagine that modeling such a process so again i'm just going to show what happens break it off see particles just floating around begin interacting and chaining and eventually making a, a percolated structure right the moment when you can go along the chain is the moment you have the formation of a gel and then natasha has been also showing how one can make self-repairing gels with a little bit of liquid it's kind of magnetic sand castle material if you like you can cut it into pieces and then you put them in magnetic field and they stick together and form one piece again uh, she can tell more about that maybe uh, we have been making uh, gels out of beads that are bound by capillary interactions and then we developed a way of um, uh, 3d printing with those beads this is the research project that um, uh, lillian is working on together with john tracy's group um, now you can print with beads and then uh, you can polymerize the bridges and you have this ultra soft structure you can put magnetic magnetic beads in that structure then uh, you can have some fun if you put those uh, these uh, meshes that are now Lillian prints you can put them in the, on the surface of water and now when you apply magnetic fields to pull it down the capillary forces because of the surface will try to, 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 to bring the structure together so you can have this symmetrically shrinking structure this asymmetrically shrinking structure I'm sure that uh, Lillian and some Chu and Dr. Trace people have had some fun here with this dispenser and then there is this two-dimensional microbot which captures a bit that falls on the surface Lillian can tell you more about this she's presently working on again in the same line of thought of if we calibrate the force now we have a, a rheometer unique type of rheometer that is needed is also rheometer to measure two-dimensional resistance on surfaces so th th this is Lillian's data of uh, what happens when you have this flap flappy thing on the surface with pure water and then you add immunoglobulin and you can actually see that it tries to go below the so you can see how it gets pulled down but now it does not it does not uh, uh, collapse that is it does not uh, uh, it, it does not um, uh, come together uh, because now we have the surface resistance of the layer the rheology of the the surface rheology of the layer of the protein that uh, opposes the motion of the two flaps uh, towards each other right so essentially by measuring the degree of flapping uh, we would we can characterize the surface properties of the protein layer this is an important for characterizing for example it, it can be a medical diagnosis for a terrible disease that sometimes occurs in uh, newborns when their lungs collapse because of the incomplete surface function uh, surface uh, protection of their lung surfaces with natural surfactant so diagnosis of surface properties is important in this case Lillian can maybe tell you a little bit about that at some other time um, this was the last of the slides that I wanted to show in, in this tutorial and kind of overview of the research. Um, a few final movies uh, shown here of, of the type of structures that I mentioned. And uh, 
uh, I'm going to go back to kind of, this is going to be now used to advertise our department in our new graduate, uh, I think, brochure. So congratulations for those group members who are still present here in this photo and, and present now for jumping, uh, for jumping so synchronously. People were impressed. So now our group is going to illustrate the enthusiasm of the whole department. <laughs> so thank you all for being so enthusiastic. <laughs> and let me answer any questions that you may have, guys, here. I have a question. Um, I, I know that you're still uh, kind of experimenting in the different types of microstructures you can make with uh, magnetic sides, but I was wondering what would happen or what do you think would happen if you had like a heterogeneous mixture of the um, cubes that might have, is it possible to make them with two sides magnetic and mm -hmm. or what kind of interactions would that have? Um, or what do you what would you expect well this is a very interesting problem right i mean this is essentially um, something that we would like to try it is very easy so it is not easy to make cubes and call let's say this this side and this side the reason is that you you kind of when you make them you you have them on a wafer yeah they're all they're flat and then i don't know how you would like shift them yeah. or 90 degrees <laughs> I, I guess needy uh, is uh, is familiar with neighbor with wafers this day as, as kind of as you just learn to call them, right? <laughs> um, so you have them on the wafer, and it is easy to do the following. If it is easy to take another wafer and turn this one around and just flip them over and call the other side. If you want to call this side, you're, you're in a big problem because how do you turn them like that? But you can call both sides. We have never done this, but now you're going to have particles which can assemble this way, or it can assemble this way, or it can assemble this way. So you have three new configurations. Well, these two are geometrically the same, but you have new configurations which you have not investigated before. So investigation of this is part of the future research that we would like to do. We think that there will be interesting structures formed. Know that this is going to be extremely stable configuration, even though extended. So uh, and it would have the properties to self-repair. That is, if you bend it, it would have very strong uh, ability to unbend itself, right? Because if you do this, these magnets are still interacting, but these magnets, I'm not sure that I have them in the right direction with regards to what is drawn here, um, and I have, haven't drawn the two dipoles, but these magnets would like to bring it back, right? So you, you're going to have a structure which is going to have property, which I am not familiar with other structures, which, which will be bending softly, but would, would also would like to kind of self-right itself and, and kind of like go straight again, right? So lots of interesting new effects, which we hope to, hope to uncover in similar type of structures. Thank you. Uh, I have one question. Um, it's a more exploratory question, actually. With all the research uh, based on um, active microstructures that respond to um, magnetic field or electric field, um, have you or, ever, or the group ever collaborated with um, people who work in biology and try to understand behavior of microorganisms in response to an environment? And uh, the second part is, um, how difficult is it to extrapolate the results for these um, relatively simple structures to the behavior of living organisms? Because I feel active matter is also very relevant for biology field, um, especially. So. We, yes, indeed we think so. Um, I, um, uh, I mean, I'm uh, sorry for that. Somebody kind of like uh, is coming by, but uh, um, so uh, we are um, uh, right now would like to investigate uh, biological structures. So our group is not does not have the knowledge with let's say biological microbiology. Um, but um, uh, we are working with um, a very excellent researcher who has started working with an excellent researcher from MPI in uh, Berlin. MPI is kind of like the leading academic institutions in, G in Germany, Max Planck Institute, uh, who is actually investigating the softness of biological membranes. So I have some beautiful images. I don't have them here, but I can show them to you at some point. We have some beautiful images where we can take a live cell and uh, we can squeeze it. And in some cases, it, it does essentially when you squeeze it, it kind of like, I mean, part of it comes out of the microbot. Kind of we squeeze it, it kind of squeezes out. And in other cases, it just bursts. 
So it depends essentially, you can think of this as um, the idea was to then uh, vary the amount of cholesterol in the membrane. So if you put too much cholesterol, essentially when you, when you take a live cell and when you squeeze it, uh, it is going to break, right? Because the, the cholesterol makes the membranes uh, more fragile. Um, so we wanted to investigate that. We did not quite finish this collaboration, but this is some possibility in the future. I mean, we, right now, obviously, international collaborations are not that easy as they were, uh, but hopefully once we can travel around, she can visit or I can visit and we can continue that research. Uh, remind me to show you kind of like how we can squeeze a cell, poor cell, uh, with kind of like, I mean, the microbot thing. Thank you. That's one of my favorite videos from Kuhi. Uh, yeah, I mean, Catherine knows it, but I don't have it here. I, well, I have it, but I mean, like, by the time I find it within the many presentations and files, I mean, it will take some time. I don't want to occupy it too long. And if our group meetings, again, sometimes can be longish, but this is mostly when we have practice talks. Um, I hope this kind of tutorial is also useful. I'm recording it, so we're going to post it also uh, online. I have a question, Dr. Vela. Uh -huh. Lily? Yeah, did you, um, yeah, did the group ever mix up patchy particles with the Janus particles to see what kind of reconfigurations you get? It would have been a great, it would have been a great topic to do also, maybe great topic for collaboration with Dr. Kretschmer. Uh, uh -huh. Frankly, we we may have tried a few things, but we did never perform the complete research like that, right? Um, essentially, right now we want to do this with cubes in the following sense that let's say you have one-sided cubes and two-sided cubes. So you can look at the two-sided cubes as kind of being cross-linkers for the structures of one-sided cubes. Right. What I'm saying is if you have one-sided cubes, so they form a chain, right? But then if you have two-sided cubes, so you can have a two-sided cube here. And then if you have another, another chain, so two-sided cubes in addition to having interesting properties on their own, can, can serve as colloidal cross-links between two. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a chain of, of, of one-sided cubes and if you put a two-sided one. So now you have a cross-link because then you can have another two-sided, uh, one-sided chain here. So, uh, essentially kind of particles which are coated with more metal uh, in this case can be cross links for the structure and can make interesting structures so certainly that's an interesting topic that, but we have not done much yet okay dr bill i've got two questions um one of them is really stupid and i think the answer is no but um are magnetic particles always electronically conductive uh, that's a, not a stupid question at all, right? This is kind of part of the very interesting properties that people would like to study about magnetic particles. Um, uh, the answer is uh, they, the conductance of magnetic chains vary. Um, so um, why is this interesting? Because you can, you can use this to make magnetic, magnetically actuated electronic sensors. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, if you make chains of magnetic particles, and if you apply magnetic fields, you're pressing them and you're decreasing the resistance through the chain. So you can essentially make a microscopic sensors using magnetic particle chains, where the electrical conductance is going to be determined by the magnetic conductance. So uh, our collaborator, Joe Tracy from Material Science, again, he's an excellent uh, and, and extremely uh, uh, pleasant professor to work with, like many of our collaborators around, of course, Dr. Dickey and other collaborators. Uh, so Dr. Tracy is actually interested in similar type of structures, but this is really important for sensing. Mm -hmm. So if you were, would it be possible to make a magnetically healing gel that is not electronically conductive? I think yes. Uh, mm -hmm. It, it is possible because if you take, and again, uh, if you want to do something like that, Dr. Trace is a good collaborator uh, because he is the expert of how you can make, a I think, a magnetic particle and coat it with silica. So essentially, uh, the silica coat is going to really prevent the magnet magnetic parts of the particles from interacting. And, and actually, if you think about it, one of the structures that I showed here, not on this slide, but uh, Natasha's um, uh, beads with two chain, with chain particles and lilians, they, they are actually going to be form magnetic structure, but it's not going to be conductive at all. 
if you have some ideas about how you can use them in batteries or something like that, let us know, right? You're very yeah. welcome. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Uh, Dr. Bell, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I was wondering why, um, like more on the simulation side, why Brownian dynamic simulations are required to validate your experimental results and explore the parameter space as opposed to just like a, you know, flipping a switch and, and, and running a simulation? Um, well, first of all, I mean, we're interested in similar structures which can be scaled down, right? And, and the more you scale it down, the more you're going to have the Brownian dynamics that is the thermal motion of the particles being important. Now, the type of structures that we have been discussing with Dr. Ho really kind of with those micro scale particles, the thermal motion is still is kind of like less predominant than let's say motion driven by the fields. Uh, but um, still, if you start with a system like that, you're going to have many features of the Brownian dynamic simulation that have to be reproduced in the simulation for the interactions, right? So essentially you're going to have a randomized system. Um, you're going to have interactions which are not going to allow the particles to come immediately in contact. And while they're doing that, the question is, do you give them enough time to flip around or do you, or not? So you can say that you're going to have a, a new structure where the Brownian, that is the Brownian motion, is going to lead to annealing and not a new structure where you have the interaction so strongly that they just stick to each other. Those two structures are going to be very interesting because they're going to be different from materials perspective. So it matters whether they're kind of just sticking to each other randomly or whether you let them rearrange themselves in the best possible configuration and minimize the energy before assembling. Okay, makes sense. So, yeah, lots of interesting things to do there. Um, I, I don't know whether you may have seen this paper. Uh, it's kind of like almost, kind of because it was a few years ago, uh, the one that um, I mentioned in JAX on the assembly of, of uh, genus particles. Uh, maybe the I one. That. It, it, was a, it was a very beautiful simulation. People loved it. So okay. we can maybe replicate some of that now. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, guys? I think I have found enough information on, 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 on kind of like for, for, for this uh, type of uh, discussion tutorial. Um, <laughs> I want to thank again, thank again everybody for their enthusiasm. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and pretty much stop the, this type of, this, of, of uh, the magnetic particle discussion. Uh, we can still take on a few group, uh, group issues if anybody has group issues. Uh, or, what, uh, or otherwise, what we have to do is uh, I have to discuss with my TAs the exam comes tomorrow. <laughs> as much as I would love to discuss in magnetic stuff, I um, really also have to consider the teaching aspects. Uh, so any last moment questions about the research part? And those of you who are interested in additional discussion, well, I'm always open for discussions. I mean, like these days it's a little bit busy, but um, uh, everybody in my group knows that I will do my best to accommodate you at the first, uh, at the first opportunity possible. So don't hesitate to drop me a line if you're interested in discussing any of the other aspects. And with Matt and Dr. Ho, we have to get together eventually and discuss some of those aspects. Um, but for now, I'm stopping the recording of the research part.